to a recording in progress. All right, now it's official. Now it's real. All right, well, let's get started with a word of prayer. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you so much for the gift of this time together, for the gift of your word uh, by which you have um, elected to speak to us. We pray, Lord, that uh, this time together would be a time of growing more and more into the image of your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So this is going to be the last of our class times. It's very short. It's just three. I know there's four chapters in Jonah, but next Monday is Memorial Day, and uh, we're not doing that. We're gonna... we've, already, we've already dove into yes. uh, three. Yes, we, 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 oh man, oh, yeah. we jumped ahead last week into, into chapter three so we could get through the whole book in four weeks. It's, it's a little uh, three quarters thing. And uh, um, yeah, short book, short class, uh, short commitment. And um, so just to remind us of some of the things uh, from way back in the first the first week when we gathered together. So, um, and one of the things I really wanted to just remind us of is the strangeness of this book in the whole of the biblical canon. There isn't another book. There is not another prophet like Jonah. It's an odd book. It's an odd um, stylistic choice by the author. It's like a weird kind of an extended parable, kind of a satire, kind of a, um, a, you know, a story in four acts. It's it's an interesting book. It's a weird book and it's a unique book. And I think one thing that happens when you spend a month reading it is it becomes normal again because you spend all this time reading it. But it's worth remembering that it is, it is, um, it is strange. It is odd compared to the other prophets in particular. Um, some other things uh, from, from earlier weeks to remind ourselves of, um, you know, the, the story is trying to tell us something about who God is. It's, it's not particularly interested in, in the history behind the story. Um, it's trying to help us understand what it means uh, to be followers of this God over and against and opposed to any other God. Um, so re just remembering our structure. So chapter one, we have the call, we have the flea, we have the storm, uh, and we have Jonah tossed overboard. Chapter two, we have the whale and the prayer from inside the belly of the whale. And then that ends with being vomited up on the shore. Chapter three, we get Jonah going into Nineveh and this eight word sermon that he preaches. And then we get to chapter four, which is kind of the, the falling action, the denouement, the the sit down between Jonah and the Lord. And this is going to have, finally, Jonah talking. I mean, he does very little talking. Hello. Uh, throughout the whole of Jonah, he just, he keeps his thoughts to himself. He expresses himself in his actions instead of in his words. And all that's going to change in chapter four. He's finally going to say what's been on his mind. Um, and, and then we have to decide, right? Is this finally Jonah being trustworthy? Is this finally Jonah, uh, you know, showing his true colors? And, and then we have to ask that broader question. What is the book trying? What are some of the bigger themes? What are some of the bigger questions that the book is trying to raise? So, um, so far, the character of Jonah, we've met this man who flees God he also seems a little to my to my ears prideful or 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 self-assured in a silly kind of way when he's on the boat and he says, I am a Hebrew, I worship the God of, of land and sea. And yet that's the same, you know, he's trying to show off his God, and yet that's the God he's running from. Um, his willingness to be thrown overboard, to risk death. Um, you know, he's certainly committed to his beliefs, whatever they might be, and he is um kind of there's a stubbornness there. Um, his, the, his prayer from the belly of the whale, it, he never apologizes. He never backs down. It's unclear if his heart has been changed. We don't know in, at the beginning of chapter three, if Jonah is changed until the minute he gets up and walks to Nineveh, right? He just, it, he's really holding back all of that information. And then when he gets to Nineveh, and this came out in my sermon on Sunday, so often we hear a phrase, thus says the Lord, when a prophet is speaking on behalf of God. And Jonah admits that. It's not clear if Jonah is quoting God. 
is this sermon God's sermon or is this sermon Jonah's? And both are interesting, but they ultimately, I think, end in the same place, which is to say the sermon isn't the point. It's what God did with it, the sermon that mattered, right? It was God's spirit being at work in these words. As fallen and and, and fallible as those words were, God chose to, to work. And so it didn't matter. This huge repentance, this campy scene of all these creatures being covered in sackcloth and ashes and this funny sentence in Hebrew where um, the humans are not allowed to feed the way animals feed. Uh, and, and and at the end of it, we have this, this um, shock that God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways. God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Right, And that's where chapter three ends. And so is this a success, right? This feels like a success. This feels like a mountaintop experience for Jonah, for any preacher to have one person come to repentance, much less a whole city come to repentance, right? This is the ultimate preaching experience. So what are our expectations for Jonah going into chapter four? Well, he's done the work, he had success, he's been through this storm and this whale and all these things, and, and he did a good job as a prophet, right? And then chapter four, verse one. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He came. Became angry. He came. He became he angry. Came yes. So, so it's funny because at the beginning of chapter three, we have this... Um, as I said in the sermon, almost verbatim, chapter three, verse one, is almost verbatim to chapter one, verse one. So we have a new beginning in the middle of the book. God's like, all right, <laughs> I'm going to give you a second chance. I'm going to ask you the same question. And Jonah makes a new decision. And then here at chapter four, we, we, we discover that the change in Jonah only runs so deep. Because for some reason... He's not happy about what should otherwise be a glorious and momentous day. And again, he is, and I just love this part of the book, that we are three quarters of the way in, and we're just now finding out what Jonah thinks. I love the delayed gratification in it. Verse two, he prayed to the Lord, like really the second time he's done this. So again, chapter three is like chapter one, and now we have chapter four being in some ways like chapter two kind of a mirror in the middle of the book. He prayed to the Lord and said, oh, Lord. And it's so great to imagine what the tone of voice could have been, you know, how angry he was with that, oh, Lord. Is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Ironically, he, he has nothing recorded of his speeches <laughs> from being in his own country. So it's like, no, Jonah, you didn't say that, but continue. That, that is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. Okay, what's it going to be? For I know, I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. What? Why is that the thing that's making him angry? This is like the most glorious expression of God's love. And for some reason, that's what Jonah has 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 lighted upon as what makes him so mad. He was second guessing God. For sure. And now, O oh Lord, verse 3, please take my life from me. This is how, this is the depth of his irrational anger. Please take my life from me, for it, it is for it is better for me to die than to live. So what's going on unspoken here, but is, I think, pretty obvious, is Jonah is mad that Nineveh repented. He's mad that God changed his mind. He's mad that God relented from punishing Nineveh. Jonah wanted Nineveh to get what they deserved. And what they deserved, by all accounts, was condemnation and destruction. And Jonah wanted that for them. He wanted condemnation and destruction. So all the way back in chapter 1, verse 1, when God calls to Jonah, and says, go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Jonah's thinking, 
you're going to forgive them, aren't you? You're going to, you're, you're slow to anger, you're a gracious God, you're merciful, and you're going to let him off the hook. That's his thought right away at the beginning. And I, this, my, what I find about Jonah so compelling is that he's not wrong. He doesn't get God wrong. He doesn't misunderstand who God is. In fact, he understands so well who God is that when God tries to be God, Jonah gets mad because Jonah doesn't want, he doesn't like that God. But he's not wrong about who God is. It takes certain, it takes a certain kind of person that a certain kind of, you know, for us Christian to get mad about God and be and be right in your anger about who God is. It's really easy to get mad at a God that doesn't exist, right? And as somebody who spends a lot of time talking to people about who they think God is, it is way more common for people to be upset at a God that is not the God of scripture, right? We build a version of God in our head, or we hear a version of God from pop culture or from maybe a bad pastor or a bad church, and we have some sense of who God is, and then we react to that. And we say, I don't like that God. I'm mad at that God. I'm angry at that God. And then they come to me and they say, hey, I'm mad at this God. I don't like this God. And I say, well, that, that's fine because that God's not real. You're mad at a phantom. Let me, let me walk with you and rediscover who God actually is. That's a very common sort of part of a faith journey is coming to understand who God actually is, letting go of your imagination and your idolatry, and then discovering, oh, the real God is, I don't need to be mad at this God. That's not Jonah. Jonah gets God right. He's 100% right about who God is. He knows the ending of the story before we do as readers. Even He knows chapter one, verse one, where this story is going to go. He's just mad about it, but he's not wrong. And I love Aaron, he, he's mad that the, he his time was wasted. God wasted his time. <laughs> yeah, in a certain sense, God 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 wasted his time or or God um co-opted Jonah into doing something he didn't want to do. He didn't want to be involved in keeping Nineveh alive. Right? I think of Pilate, I wash my hands of this, right? That's what Jonah wanted to do. He wanted to not be caught up in this gracious thing <laughs> he wanted to be able to hate Nineveh it's kind of surprising that he wants to end his life but I mean, yes I, I, can, I can see him rejecting him okay I knew you were gonna do that all along but why doesn't he go along his very way why does he think he needs to end his life so it, it so it, hang on because it, it gets even better right yeah. so so he says I'm so angry uh, I, I it is better for me to die than to live and the Lord said is it right for you to be angry? Jonah, resuming his, his, her, his petulant child routine, then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. <laughs> so he's so mad he could die. He's annoyed to be involved in this whole thing. And now, instead of going home, instead of going on his merry way, instead of resuming his life, he goes and sits on a hillside looking out over Nineveh, just waiting. I wonder what's going to happen next. Like, he, maybe I'll change his mind. yeah, maybe God's going to decide to destroy it all of a sudden. Maybe this repentance won't hold, and then they'll and then they'll get what's coming to them. It's it's like the um you know, the 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 infatuated or obsessed person who says you know i'm i'm not obsessed i'm not interested but then won't leave you alone right follows you around you know it's it's that it gives that kind of uh that kind of vibe so he's super angry doesn't go home he makes this little structure for himself and he sits out to watch the city uh in the desert and now the lord is going to do something really uh really fascinating the lord is going to create a parable and involve Jonah in the parable. Jonah's going to become a living character in the parable. So the Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade to his head 
to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. His emotional range is just all over the place. But when dawn came up the next day, so now Jonah spent all night out here, by the way. When dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die <laughs> again. <laughs> so he's, he wants to die. He's happy. He wants to die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. Right. So this is the parable right, of, of, of Jonah that he's involved in. And now God is going to try and, and, and coax out of Jonah some level of understanding of everything that's just happened. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And Jonah said, yes, angry enough to die. He's just the most uh, like emo. Yeah, like just, yeah, just a middle schooler. Three times. Three times, three times he wants to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor in which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals. And that's where the story ends with this question from God to Jonah. So the parable, right? Jonah, he has a bush. He loves a bush. The bush disappears. He's upset. And God says, that's like me and Nineveh. Nineveh is even more to me than a bush. And you're out here, Jonah, wishing for me to destroy them when you're sad that a bush died? Think about those 120,000 people dying. Why doesn't that make you sad? If you're willing to get upset over a bush, why aren't you willing to get upset over these 120,000 people who don't, by the way, don't even know their right hand for their left? I mean, real insult here, real backhanded uh, anti Nineveh uh, uh, insult here. It's hard to know, you know, to what extent is this God being, you know, deeply caring for this backwards people? And to what extent is this another joke at Nineveh's expense that? You know, this is a story for Israel, right? Israel still doesn't like Assyria and Nineveh. And so it there's a possibility here that what's happening is Israel is being, you know, they're they're being challenged in this story. And we'll come to that in a minute. What is what is Israel supposed to be walking away from having read this story? They're being challenged and pushed. But there's also these moments in the narrative that almost feel like they're taking the pressure off of Israel by making fun of Israel's enemy, Nineveh, right? By teasing the enemy and giving these sort of comedic moments, it takes a little of the sting out of the rebuke to Israel. So having, having Ninevites dress up their animals in sackcloth is a moment to kind of take the sting out of the rebuke against Israel. And here, having describing them as people who don't know their right hand from their left, the another little moment of just trying to take the sting out of the harshness of the rebuke against Israel. Uh, but it ends with this question, and the question just hangs in the air. I think the parable is pretty easy to understand. Why does the book end in question? What's the function of ending a book in a question? Sequel. A sequel. Jonah part two, <laughs> the revenge of the worm. What happened to it? <laughs> it's like June. Yeah, that's the worm. A sequel, that's possible. Why else would a book end with a question? It'll end your own name. Yes. When a book ends with a question, or when a sentence or a sermon ends with a question, it's to get the people reading it to answer the question. Right? I'm putting it in the air so that you will go, oh, what is the answer? If I give you an answer, now, now the burden is off of you to answer it for yourself. 
So this is a rhetorical strategy to force the question onto us. And the question is, quite simply, what do we care about less than a bush? <laughs> right? What are the things that we care about less than we would care about a bush? And that's, in the context, this is Israel, right? So Israel, and I think I, think I said this last week, Israel is called to be a nation with three blessings. The first, this all comes out of God and Abraham. The first is you will be a great people, numerous. The second is you will have a land. And the third is you will be a blessing to the nations. At this time, their land is being threatened. There's still a great number of people. And the reason that their land is being blessed, uh, being threatened is because they're struggling to be a blessing to the nations. <laughs> Right? They're failing to be a light to the nations. They're giving into idolatry. They're giving into um, worshiping all these other gods and living in these sinful ways. And that is making it so that they can't be God's people to the whole world. That's their failure. They want, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're failing to, to display God to the rest of the world. And that was a part of their call. That was their responsibility. That was a part of their covenant. And so this is a turn in trying to turn Israel from an insulated, nationalistic, self-centered country and people to an outward-facing, evangelistic, you know, people. Of course, in the story of salvation, Israel continues to fail. And so rather than threatening the whole world's ability to know God, God shows up to address this himself by being born of a virgin, right? It, God's like, if you can't do it, I will do it, okay? So God does it as a human and becomes the person who, who can affect that, um, that change to make what we now call the church an outward-facing evangelistic sharing, spreading the gospel, sharing the gospel, right? But just as much as Israel had a temptation to turn inward and to keep God to themselves, the church has that same temptation, right? We have our own Ninevehs. We have our own um, enemies that we don't want to share the gospel with. And this is, I think, the most the most central question of the book of Jonah is, is what is it, who are our Ninevehs? Who do we care about less than a bush? And it's, um, it's an interesting, it's a tricky question. In different moments in church history, it's been, uh, it's been more obvious uh, than in other moments of church history. So, you know, Early on, um, the Greek-speaking Christians and the Latin-speaking Christians did not get along. <laughs> They're both Christians, but they spoke a different language. And in their defense, trying to translate these really technical theological categories from Greek to Latin turned out to be very difficult. And they kept thinking the other ones were falling into heresy because the, the translations weren't, weren't supporting their views. And so, uh, you know, before too long, you have an Eastern church and you have a Western church. You have a Latin speaking church in the West and you have a Greek speaking church in the East. And that persists until today with the Catholic church and the Orthodox church. And it was fundamentally, I mean, it was more complicated than this, but it was a breakdown over language and an inability to show enough grace to people, to Christians who spoke another language. And it became an unwillingness to allow them into their church an unwillingness to allow them to get baptized, to take communion, to worship with them, right? And before long, these other Christians became Nineveh to the Catholics or to the Orthodox. Does the Eastern Church, the Orthodox Church, do they celebrate Pentecost? They do, uh, but their church calendar is different than the Western church calendar. I don't know what day they, they do it on. Be, yeah, they have a... They so have they a celebrate the Yes, Spirit. yeah, yeah. Um, just one example of the church becoming insular and inward facing. Um, there's, there's thousands of examples throughout church history of the church having these Ninevehs. And it's, I think, an interesting question 
today because it be it is easy to take our answer of who is our Nineveh from who we're told aren't we um who who like the broader American culture thinks our Ninevehs are. And sometimes it's easy to think that I know who your Nineveh is because a broader American culture has told me that you don't like these people, this group, right? The question, anytime you're trying to figure out who, who is this Nineveh, which is a kind of enemy, but it's not quite an enemy. Um, it's, it's very difficult, I think, to answer that question honestly. There's a lot of voices that are telling us this group doesn't like that group. That group doesn't get along with this group. These people are fighting or feuding. When you do this, it shows you, it, it proves that you don't like, right? There's a lot of that. There's a lot of camping and creating camps and creating um, alliances and disagreements and fights. And sometimes those things are true. Um, and sometimes when you talk to folks, you'll find, you'll find, there is a, a little video uh, today of um, a, talking head talk saying, you know, as a Jewish woman, I don't know where I can walk around safe in America. And then it cut to a Jewish man who went to little, to, he, he's a New York guy and he w w walked around like a Palestinian area and was like, look, this is how you walk around as a Jewish man. Like you just, he's like, you just walk. And he like, so there's, and we, we know this is true. Sometimes fights are set up in media or in pop culture between groups. And then if you actually, Go to those places and talk to those people you realize oh there's not there's not actually a fight here this has been manufactured or created in some way but at the same time it is the case that we have none of us and sorting out which ones are actually none of us from the ones that we're being told this group doesn't like that group i as i've been thinking about this these past month it's tr it's difficult work it's difficult work I think part of it's difficult because we have been told that we're not supposed to have Ninevehs. That's one of the biggest, I think, barriers that gets in our way. We know we're not supposed to. We know we're supposed to love our enemies. We know we're not, you know, the Good Samaritan is a person we're supposed to help. We're not supposed to pass by them. And that, I think, means that we tend to bury more deeply in our hearts who it is that we're unwilling to see saved. And that makes it harder to excavate, harder to bring it to light, harder to be honest with ourselves and one another about. So I've been trying to think of different ways to get at how you might discover who a Nineveh is for you. And I, we can do this personally. You can also think of these kind of questions corporately. But one question that I had in mind that I thought might do it would be, and this is a little preview of the sermon on Sunday, so uh, hopefully you won't be too bored. Um, if imagine you're sitting in the pews and you hear a door into the sanctuary and you turn and look and somebody's coming into the church, who's a person that could walk in that would make you get up and leave? Right. That's what I was thinking, uh, it, that's culture and language. I mean, like the East and West. Church, yeah. Because of uh, language barriers and yeah. cultural differences. Yeah. You're right. And this is some of the things we are doing this six week study on uh, out of context. Mm -hmm. So, and this is a great uh, example that you give. So, let's say a Middle Eastern person walks with children. In right, the, right. And they open the door. Right. They don't know what they're carrying in the Alabia, right? Sure. So, we probably will start running, right? <laughs> yeah. Whether they're getting Who's, guns. What, right. What kind of person might walk in that either would make you get up and leave or would make you feel anxiety? I think for some of us, there's a literal human being that we know and could have put a name to that if they came to our church would be annoyed at the very least, if not downright ready. Like if they're in the right. room, I don't want to be in the room because my history with them is such right. that I don't want, I don't think I can sit in this room and worship with them, right? It's possible for some folks. Uh, there are certainly people who we would struggle to worship alongside. And then there are, right, char uh, characters of people, right? If you see somebody walking in and they've got a hijab on or something like this, 
right? What emotion might you feel, right? And is that an indication then that maybe this is a Nineveh? Maybe this is a place where we are unwilling to extend to this caricature of a person God's grace, right? So that question, if you're sitting in the sanctuary and somebody walks in, right? That's how I, that's the question that I thought maybe will help unearth some of what would make somebody a Nineveh? Who would have to walk in that would make me uncomfortable or that would make me not want to be there? Whether that's a, an actual person that we know and have ha, have a history with, or is it a is it a type or a character in some kind of way? I think that that was the, the kind of uh, emotion or fear that Jonah was experiencing when he when he first uh, decided that he was going to go in the other direction. Yes, so I think the Nineveh in the story functions very much as a type. The story is not literally interested in the place of Nineveh. It's interested in choosing a character that would elicit from the average Israelite an empathy with Jonah. So that at the end, you can make that character arc and go, oh, Jonah was in the wrong, therefore I was in the wrong. Right. They wanted to choose a character. The story is told in such a way that Nineveh becomes um, not it's not about Nineveh. It's about creating in us that emotional reaction. Of, I agree with Jonah. I'm not going there. Right. And our distance from Nineveh doesn't mean we don't still have those characters. Right. Um, so, yeah, imagining you're in a sanctuary, who would you not want to see? I think also questions, I, I've been trying to think, what is it, what's a more like structural way that churches create Ninevehs? Who do we make it hard on to be a participant in our church? Who do we make it difficult to be a participant in our church? That's a harder question. I haven't really narrowed that one down. Um, I do, you know, so one kind of it, it, it's a fine way of thinking about it but i'm not i'm not convinced it's super helpful but one thing that's sometimes talked about when we talk about different churches when you walk into church on a sunday and you you know you walk through a parking lot that has bmws and teslas and you know these sorts of cars and you're driving a beat up whatever whatever you know hand me down you know, Ford Pinto, are you, it, it, and, and this is like a class question, right? It does the church set itself up as a class to be exclusive in a certain kind of way? Is the church, um, does it require you to spend so much money in order to meaningfully participate in the events and activities of the church? If everything costs money, right? You might not be explicitly saying you have to make a certain amount to come here, but you're implicitly saying if you don't have this amount of, of spending money, it's difficult for you to participate in our church events, right? Because everything costs 20 bucks, which to me is not a big deal, but to somebody else might be a big deal, right? And that becomes a way for a church to say, we want our church to look like this, which is middle class. We want you to have this much flexible spending. We want you to be this kind of a, and if I asked you, do you think poor people deserve the gospel? You would say yes, but you're creating a church structure that keeps them away or that makes it more difficult, right? That becomes another kind of way we create Nineveh's. And again, it's very deep. So it's hard to unearth this stuff. Sometimes it's hard to sort out. Is this an essential part? Is this accidental? You know, one thing like, um, you know, there's, if you were in a, if you were in a, a downtown church, um, and you didn't have a big parking lot, uh, you know, but you went out of your way to make sure that there was tons of bike racks or something like that, right? Like, what does it mean to be accessible, right? That becomes another way that we can create barriers to entry. And, um, you know, we don't have a parking lot, but... <laughs> That's, that's a slightly different problem for us. Uh, yeah, we got Trader Joe's. So, like, so, so, I'm trying to think: what are some other ways that churches create Nineveh's from their culture, from their, um, 
Yeah, kind of through accidental ways. The, the clicks that kind of occur in church. Yeah, um, clicks. Like yeah, people. Somebody from the outside comes in, and does do does anybody go up to them? Do they converse with them? We we ran into a case like that recently, and and or does that person just stand there in the middle while all the people who know everybody know each right. other all talk? Yeah. yeah, there's a certain if you don't. There's a kind of pre-approval process. You got to come with a friend in order to to make your way in, right? You kind of need to be pre-vetted and be brought into a group. And if you're not brought into a group, maybe we're not. You know, th there can be other ways that churches create these barriers. Um, this is, I think, and it, it's it's I think the central question of the Book of Jonah is is this invitation to consider what do we care what what's what do we care about less than a bush, right? But I do think it's a hard question. And um, I don't think there are easy answers, which is why I think it's told in a story form. If if the book of Jonah was just Jonah outlining this, you can sort of take it in, you can hear it, and you can kind of walk away from it. But when it's a story, and especially a story that ends with this kind of question mark hanging, it kind of haunts you as a reader. It sticks with you, especially a story with as vivid of imagery as storms and, you know, giant fish and these, you know, a giant towering plant and a, and a worm that eats it and the cows covered in sackcloth, right? Like really vibrant images. And so hopefully as you walk around carrying the story in you, as you have interactions or hear you know, sit on me, sit in meetings or, 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 or make decisions about a church as the church, you, that story kind of sits in the background and all of a sudden something highlights it and you go, oh, is that decision, maybe that conversation, that conversation is highlighted in Nineveh. We don't want to touch that thing. But you said a very important thing. You said that Jonah never lost sight of who God is. Right. So when we see that we've set up barriers, it can never be at the expense of the, the truth of the gospel. Right. The truth of the gospel. And I would I would suggest that that we rarely set up barriers. I mean, the, the Eastern Church and the Western Church, when they split, they believed they were safeguarding, and they were safeguarding doctrine. With a thousand years to look back on it. <laughs> right? Did we need to hold such, did, did, was there more room for grace between Eastern Orthodox theology and Catholic theology? There was more room. Even in such a, a important conversation as to how you describe the three members of the Trinity, which was a central part of the debate because the Latin personae did not match the Greek, I don't even remember the word, uh, those didn't line up. I mean, it was a central debate. And yet when we look back with a thousand years of timeline, we go, ah, there was more, there's been more give and take than we maybe knew at the time. So yes, Jonah, Jonah knew that God was, and, and he steals it from Joel, which I find interesting as well. Gracious, merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. So I think particularly when we think about who is a Nineveh, it's not just a generic enemy. It is specifically somebody that we are unwilling to see repent. Somebody that we are unwilling to see come to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a very specific thing. It's not just generic, who do we not want in our church? It's more specific than that. Do we think that the poor, because they can't contribute financially, shouldn't spend time here, right? It's a more pointed question than that. Do we think, which no one would ever say yes to, right? But structurally, have we created a situation that keeps them out? Um, it's funny, if you think about things in the kind of liberal uh, to conservative spectrum, which is misleading, but sometimes helpful, the extremes on both do this in different ways, but they do the same thing. So the extreme conservative which it's again it's not it goes beyond actually anything meaningfully conservative 
But when you push into that kind of um, the extremes of conservative ideology, and you end up at something like the Proud Boys, right? This sort of neo-Nazi movement. They would claim to be conservatives. They have taken, um, their Nineveh is very easy to identify, right? Because it's a white supremacist ideology. So their Nineveh is anybody that is non-white. And they explicitly believe that those folks aren't worth Salvation, they don't, aren't worth saving. Now, these folks aren't Christian. They claim to be Christian and they steal a lot of Christian imagery. Um, but the the far, that far side of things, their way is an explicit racism, right? The far left side of things, they do an interesting thing where they, the far left's view of um kind of a libertarianist view in a certain kind of way, not libertarianist. They, there is a way in which if you don't, if you're not a liberal just exactly the way they are a liberal, right, then you are as good as a neo-Nazi, right? They have now said, a, Nin a Ninevite for them is anybody who is not exactly the same liberal that they are, right? There's a real certain, um, uh, um, extreme end of this is the only way to be a good citizen is to uphold these certain values and they're liberal values but if you don't hold them you're immediately out right so they both edges both sides have that ability to create Ninevehs out of people and those are clear and extreme those ones are clear and extreme yes but all as, of us in the middle as you scoot in it becomes harder and harder and harder and I think on the one hand, it's because as you move towards something more re rational and reasonable, there are fewer. I do think it's true that there are fewer Ninevehs, uh, you know, if you're not at the extreme end. So that's, that's good news. Um, but at the same time, it would be easy to say, I don't have any. And that's what I'm trying to avoid, to say, I don't have any, and then to try and walk away and leave the story behind. That's what I don't want any of us to do, regardless of how centrist we may find ourselves to, again, use that imperfect analogy. Um, Our culture loves to give labels. Yes. we can think we can identify that. If we yes. If we can label them, we know how they think. Right. It's, it's, it's simplified. Right. And, and so, and I hate labels. Uh, but but that that's what the media is great about. It yes. Because it broadcasts it. I mean, they, they look for people in the extremes because that's good news. Right. And and so that's what we get bombarded with. All yes. The time. So we think that's what people think all the time. Right. As I said. And like you say, the vast majority of them are, are in, in here. Much closer here. together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's where it becomes important for everybody, especially when when members of a church, to ask the question for themselves and for their specific community. Who might be our Nineveh? Because it's it's the odds of it relating to these sort of categorizations that are happening more broadly are slim. It's not necessarily true. And there can be something accidental or intentional happening in your local congregation that doesn't map onto national problems. And so if if you're not looking and, and, and open to the possibility of that failure, you, you're not going to see it. Right. You're but not would, see it. Uh, Darren, I, I think you are really asking good questions in context of the church. Yeah. Our name anyway. Now, would you say like uh, uh, social status, uh, cultural uh, barriers, and um, uh, what's the trick? Plays big role in those. Uh, uh, maybe like as you're saying, you might not even. Think about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the difficulty of, of culture is that it is invisible when you're in your own, right? It's the air you breathe, you're comfortable, and you don't see it by and definition. You don't mean it bad, in bed with Right. You don't mean. And so this is an this would be an argument for um, going out of your own cultural context right? Swimming in different water so that you go, oh, this is a thing that I always did because I thought it was normal. But now I see there's another culture that sees that thing differently and, and lives the gospel in that way that I didn't, 
I hadn't even thought about because I wasn't, I wasn't doing, I wasn't, it was never there. And those can be moments that also show us who, who Nineveh's are, right? You, you're that, that, that familiarity breeds ignorance, right? Um, Nineveh is, is, um, Easy to see in hindsight, too, I would say. It's very tricky to spot it when you're in the midst of keeping it away, because you always have good reasons. <laughs> you always have very good and reasonable reasons for not engaging with that Nineveh. And it takes usually some hindsight um, to recognize the mistake. You know, in some ways, I think the the, the church in the South that defended slavery, right? That was an obvious Nineveh. It was explicit Nineveh. And there's a gift to being explicit with who you hate because it can be seen so clearly. And I just, I worry, we're, not worry, for my own self, I worry. I worry that we pressed with so much sense of what's right and what's good. We've pressed down those parts of us uh, that that would otherwise have just explicitly told us who our Ninevehs are, right? Um, it's a good thing that we've done that. It's a good thing that we're not so explicit with our with our hatreds, but at the same time, it does create more difficulty uh, because sometimes that social nicety gets in the way of us really identifying the root of a failure that we would otherwise, I think, want to get rid of and to and to and to overcome. During the ministry of Jesus, yeah. Who was seen who yeah. as their Nineveh? Yeah, yeah. So during the ministry of Jesus, you definitely have a Jew-Gentile thing going on, right? Everybody in Samaria, right? The, the Gentiles. Um, you had certain classes of Jews, uh, tax collectors, yeah, right. prostitutes. You had the Romans as, as Gentiles, as oppressors. The, uh... And for Jesus in particular, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, although for the common folk, they were loved. They were well liked. They were the leadership. They no one knew any better than you know the Sadducees and the Pharisees were you know respected. Respected, and so Jesus was unique in saying, "No, your religious leadership is creating this yoke, this burden." Um, and the, it was one of the reasons why Jesus was not well, particularly well liked, because he was coming after other people who were well liked. I think that question of who would it be hard for you to see. Or whose conversion story would you doubt? Or whose, um, even if they said that they had come come to know Christ, uh, would you be suspicious of? Right? Those are the kinds of things that I think this story is getting at. You know, a, somebody who says, "I used to be a neo-Nazi, but now uh, I'm not." Right? Somebody who says to really push things. Um, somebody who says, "I used to struggle with pedophilia, but I." And no longer do, or I am in therapy, and you know, like some somebody uh, with that in their background. Um, you know, who are the folks in our society that we would most struggle to integrate into our church communities? And I don't. When I ask this question, I don't mean I'm saying that we need to come. We need to be no holds barred with folks who come in with certain histories. I'm saying who are the folks that you would doubt that you would struggle that you would not want to do outreach with, that you would not want to even extend grace to? Who would it be hard? Those are the folks that I think this story is about. It's really pressing as just to the most extreme possible extent into God. God is willing for all to repent, right? The yeah. Russians, right? The, you know... Folks in, you know, folks on name any conflict, right? Um, those are the ones that this story is about. And it's not so simple as to just say, well, I'm going to love everyone, right? That becomes a kind of whitewashing of the difficulty. It's difficult for Jonah because Jonah knows the evil that Nineveh has done. And you can't have true repentance and reconciliation without honest expression of sin. Right? Jonah knows fully the sin that Nineveh has done. He's not covering it over. He's not ignoring it. He's taking that seriously. And he's also, in running, taking very seriously 
although wrongly, he's taking very seriously God's willingness to forgive. And I think a lot of times we're not even at the level of Jonah, right? Because we're not even willing to acknowledge the depths of sin or the heights of grace. We're just this middling thing that doesn't take a stand one way or the other. Jonah is much better than we are for at least running. At the end of chapter four, um, you know, God makes it very, very simple. And, and he, he talks about uh, about the Ninevites mm -hmm. just not knowing their left hand from the right hand. Right. And in essence, maybe right and wrong. Yeah, there is there is a moral um, double entendre there. Yes, okay. yes. Because Eugene Peterson says, he says, uh, so why can't I likewise change what I feel about Nineveh from anger to pleasure? This big city of more than 120,000 childlike people. Yeah, yeah. Who don't know right from wrong. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah. There, and it would somebody who's uh, to say that they don't know right from wrong, you know, you look at somebody and you say, oh, my gosh, they've done terrible things. That's an indication they don't know right from wrong. We would much rather say what they did terrible things because they're terrible people. They're <laughs> and so they don't deserve anything else. But God, I mean, the, the evilness of Assyria was not in question. And so even for God to say, well, they don't even know right from wrong. That would have been infuriating to an Israelite. What do you mean they don't know to make that kind of double entendre right hand from their left? What do you mean they do? they've done the, they've done nothing but evil things? Of course they know better. And God's like, no, not really, because if they knew better, they wouldn't. Right? That's that's a hard. That would be a hard sermon to preach. Would be for me to to pick some some universal enemy and to talk about them as though they're just these children who don't know right from wrong. I mean, people would be really furious with that description. And that's, that's I think, getting to the heart of how radical the love of God is and God's willingness to see people repent. And it goes to how deep our sinfulness is, that even when it comes to God's grace, we want to keep it for ourselves. We don't want to do the hard work of finding and listening to God as God tells us who else to share the gospel with. And sometimes it means we don't want to trust. I think we see here in Jonah also with him going to sit, in, sit outside the city. We don't want to, he doesn't want to trust Nineveh's repentance. It's all a show. It's not real, right? It's, he's sitting there because he either wants something bad to happen or he doubts what's happened was true. He's looking for failure to come their way. He doesn't want what's best for them even after all that's happened. You know, is there a, or do we find ourselves, uh, even when somebody has, you know, um, you know, offer their life to Christ, do we find ourselves sitting there watching them like a hawk waiting for them to mess up, waiting to pounce and be like, ah, it wasn't true. You didn't actually repent. Right? That's another kind of piece of this. And I'll Aaron, yes. I've always uh, had a hard time with the Nazis that had sent so many people into, you know, the, the burning furnaces and everything, and then go to church on Sunday and on Monday, they're doing the same thing again. Yeah, yeah. The German the German church was one of these churches that um, would be a great example of a church that has become, uh, right, insular. They focused on themselves. They're an extreme example. Um, and they've lost the ability to see the humanity of other people around them. And that is really key, right? What does it mean to not see, to see someone not as human? Nineveh, Nineveh are not human folk. And one of the things that's so interesting is... Um, God extends God's reach from e humans into the created world all throughout the book of Jonah. He's sending storms. He's sending whales. He's appointing, I think is a word that's used. Um, he appoints the bush to grow. He appoints the sun to shine, the harsh wind to blow. He appoints uh, the bug to come and eat the bush. He appoints all these things in the, in the natural and created world. And in some ways, I see this as a bit of a buffer. That God is saying, it's not even enough that you stop with humans at seeing humans as valuable. I want you to press even further, right? If we were to think of a kind of a chain of being with humans at the top and, you know, the grubbiest plant at the bottom. God's saying narratively throughout this story, the whole thing, all of creation is this thing that I care for. 
and can appoint to do my will. So don't even just stop with humans. As a safeguard, go further and view highly even the true least of, of inanimate things like storms. And then if you can see all those things as valuable, you'll be safe against the dehumanizing work of that we see with, you know, so many moments in, 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 in history. Push further, create a little buffer zone so that you don't fall into that trap of, of, of seeing people as less than God sees them. Their hope for humanity. This, <laughs> their hope for humanity, not on our own, not on our own. And and um, yeah, and then the, the next question that I'll leave you with is um, what, we, I mean, we've kind of gestured toward this all throughout, but it's it's always good to ask when reading an Old Testament pass, uh, story or passage, you know, what does Jesus, when Jesus comes on the scene, what does Jesus, because Jesus is always, um, he's like, he's turning it up, you know, he's turning the, the volume up to 11, he's, he's taking the Old Testament and, you know, the way Jesus talks about it is fulfilling the Old Testament, but, but he's, he's heightening it, he's highlighting it in some way, shape, and form, so, so what Israel was being called to do in Jonah, Jesus is in some way turning up the volume on that. Um, I've, I've quoted it before, but when Jesus said, uh, when, when we hear in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, right? That's hot. That's God so loved Israel is the Old Testament expression. And with Christ, we get just the next notch up. God so loved the world. Where does Jonah where does Jesus take Jonah and just turn the intensity up a little bit? Um, and on in turning it up, the other thing that Jesus does, a good reminder from Pentecost on Sunday, is uh, enables even greater ability through the Spirit, through the church, to fulfill the work of God, right? To, to, um, to actually accomplish, right? Israel's failure uh, is Christ's success. And so those of us who are in Christ have just that more uh, power through the Holy Spirit to do the things that God is calling Israel to do and then us to do through Christ. All right, I'll stop talking. We're a couple of minutes after. Uh, I'll close this in prayer. Um, and then I think I told my stories last week, so I don't, okay. I don't have my stories to tell. All right, let me close this in prayer. Lord, once again, we thank you for the gift of the book of Jonah. We thank you for this servant, um, this prophet uh, on the run. We pray, Lord, that as, as we leave, we would not leave this story behind, but we would carry it with us, and that by its words, Lord, you would, uh, through your Holy Spirit, help us see, help us discover who might be a Nineveh for us, who might we care about less than a bush. And we don't want to be like that, Lord. We don't want to be the kind of Christians that, uh, that hold your grace uh, too closely and fail to share it with others. Help us, Lord, to know who you are and be glad for it. I pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Darren. Lovely to see you all. Thanks for joining us for this short little uh, three-week class. And uh, the end of the story will come on Sunday as well. You've gotten a bit of a preview, so lovely to see you. Bye.